uh, we moved here 25 years ago. I might as well give you the whole history. So we moved over here 25 years ago. And uh, at the time I was a manager for Hannaford Supermarkets here in Skowhegan. And I got so, I didn't really like my job there that much. I didn't like the responsibility. I didn't like working indoors and I didn't like being salary. So we own a little over 30 acres here. And uh, when I originally bought the property, I didn't buy it for the house. Our house is a hundred year old farmhouse and it was in pretty rough shape. The, but the property was really nice. We, got a, we had a field and apple orchards and big maple trees and stone walls leading up to the property. So the property was really nice. The house needed a lot of work, but my wife went along with it and let me buy the place. And so we sold our place over in New Vineyard where we moved from. And the first thing I did was fix up the house. And then after like five years of living here, four or five years of living here, I made the decision to start a guide business. So the little woods road that goes right up here, I built my first cabin up there. I cut all the uh, all the lumber in the in the winter time. I cut uh, fir and spruce and cedar poles and peeled them and uh, made the frame out of that. Cut down some big pine and had a guy come with a wood miser mill and uh, milled that out. So we started with the remote cabin up in the woods with uh, everything's gas up there, gas stove, gas refrigerator, gas lights. And then I ended up, uh, the second place that I built was here. Uh, we ended up, we decided that we wanted uh, a place with uh, running water and flush toilet and electricity and all the amenities. So this was the second cabin that we did. And then the third cabin, is actually you can't see from here it's down around the corner from my house I built it on the very back of our lot thinking that if I ever needed to sell a place to get some raise some money or whatever I would do that and that's how we ended up with the bean pond camps about an hour north of here we have three cabins on a fly fishing trout pond up there and how I raised the money to get that was I sold the camp down around the corner so that left us with three cabins up on Bean Pond and two cabins here. And then just a few years ago, there was a cabin across the road uh, with four acres of land. We came back from the moose hunt. There was a for sale sign on it. So we bought that place. And so now we're back to, we have three cabins here and three cabins up north. And it looks like Steven, my son that works for me, we may be in the process of buying a, a bear business. So. We've got to put an addition on this place, put another bedroom on and another bathroom. So I'm always buying something or selling something or building something or adding on. So that's how guide businesses go, I guess. You just you start out small and then you just keep building. All right, Brian wants to know the story behind the, uh, the moose rack that's up here. Well, it actually, uh, back when uh, Hal owned his, his previous business up in Jackman, uh, I always used to guide for him the first week because they're more, much more likely to get snow up there than we are down here. It's an hour and 15 minutes north of here, plus it's in the mountains, so I always guided for him the first week. And I found a place up there not too far from uh, where his remote camp is uh, up on his lease that had a lot of deer and a lot of moose. And I actually, I wish I had got in there a few years earlier because the first couple of years I was guiding deer hunters in there, I just, I was finding sheds all the time. And there was a really good gene pool up there, evidently, because Hal told me the best moose that he ever saw, uh, he saw up there. And this bull here was, I figured, uh, it's been, you know, screwed to the side of my camp here for a long time now, and it shrunk up some and bleached out, and I probably should have kept it inside and kept it good, but it looked good on the cabin. And uh, But anyway, it's a Boone and Crockett class moose rack from Maine uh, and I tried to figure from the skull plate and everything when I first found it it was over 60 inches really nice big palms he had good fronts I think he's got six on this front over here uh, I found it guiding a deer hunter one day we were going through some 
open hardwoods looking for deer sign and I looked down about a hundred yards in the woods and I told my client, I said, I think that's a moose rack laying there. And he said, nah, that's too big. He said, that must be a stump. And I'm like, no, I see, I see those white points. Cause at the time it wasn't bleached out as much, but I still, I could see those ivory points sticking up. Little did I know when I was walking down, I just, I figured it was going to be one moose antler, but that moose must've just like shook his head because one of them was laying right on top of the other. So I found those laying right out in some open hardwoods and one laying on top of the other. <clears throat> but I was guiding him, so I said, well, we'll mark this with the GPS and then we'll come back and, you know, pick them up and I'll lug them out to the truck on the way back. So I probably lugged them. I don't know. I lugged them a long ways. My arms were tired by the time I got back to the truck. But it's kind of funny. They'd been laying there for a year. They had been dropped the previous year. But I was so paranoid thinking that somebody was going to find them before I got back that I brought them down in the little thicket there and put them in a thick spot and covered them up with brush and did everything. And like I said, they'd been laying there for a year and nobody had found them. But I was afraid somebody was going to find them that day before I got back. So. We're going to continue telling deer stories, I guess, at Shanza's Guide Service tonight. So Adam just told his Vermont deer story and... I was just telling Brian one of my favorite deer stories because it was my first trip to Ontario back, uh, he said, I don't know how long ago it was, 15 years ago maybe. Uh, the first year that we went to Ontario, the first year I went, we went in December after we were done guiding all of our deer hunters. And the trouble was, it was a year where <laughs> it was brutally cold and the bucks all lost their horns early. so. We knew we were in trouble because the first day Hal and I tracked a buck together and uh, when we finally saw it, it was just as bald as we were, no no antlers. But this one here, I ended up, uh, I was tracking that buck and found one side and kept tracking him, found the other side, so would have been a 10. These, these points here are actually, that's kind of common in Ontario, they stick right out in front of the brow tines. The brow tines are up here, but he snapped his brow tines off, so he's still a eight, but he would have been a 10. So, not a lot of mass, but wide and long points and good buck. I'd have definitely shot him, but I didn't have to shoot him. I got his antlers without shooting him. Did you, get, did you pull that tag? Right uh, nope, nobody did. We never, we never shot a buck that year. We couldn't find a buck with antlers. Uh, the last day we were there, Mike Featherstone and Hal and I all tag teamed a buck and, uh, they actually, uh, Hal had crossed over the track and Mike stayed on the track and they pushed it right in front of me and it didn't have any antlers. So, and that was the last day of the hunt. We never shot a buck that year. Yep, I can't remember how many guys were up there. I think there was like seven or eight of us and we didn't shoot a buck because we couldn't find one with antlers. So, okay, the middle moose is my moose from uh, last year. A lot of people know it took me 40 years to finally get my own moose permit and I'd shot moose on other people's permits as a subpermittee, but it took me 40 years to get my own permit. So Big Woods Bucks hired a camera guy, Jason, to follow me around and Chris Dalty had always told me he wanted to go with me. So we ended up shooting the number one largest rack moose in the state last year. So it was worth the wait. And anybody that wants to watch that, they can watch the YouTube video on Big Woods Box. I actually got three generations of uh, moose here. The smaller one over here, my son got drawn uh, when he was 12 or 13 years old, and I was guiding some hunters, so my dad took him. And that's just an average main moose. I think it was like 46 or 47 inches. It was a young moose, but uh, Stephen shot it, so I had it mounted. And then the one all the way up in the top, the European mount, uh, my dad, when he turned 70, they gave him a moose permit. If you had the maximum number of points and hadn't been drawn when you turned 70, they gave you a permit. So that bull ended up being one of the oldest bulls killed that year. We had we had four guys in moose camp that week, and Stevens guy killed one that was seven and a half. And I can't remember what Sean's was. And then... I guided my dad, and that one was 13 and a half, and Brett guided a guy that got one that was 15 and a half. So we shot 
Brett's, I think, was the oldest bull taken that year. I think somebody shot a cow that was older, but so that was the oldest bull, and my dad's must have been right up there. Like I said, it was 13 and a half years old. Still a nice moose. His antlers probably started going the other way, but it was still a nice bull. Well, that the rack. that yeah. rack right over there in the corner, uh, my dad shot that when I was a junior in high school. Uh, I'll show you. We're going to go in the house in a little bit, but I shot my first deer when I was 13 years old up in Cocajo. I shot a 200-pound buck with a really nice, heavy eight-point rack. So we started hunting in the Cocajo area, but we were headed to Cocajo that day, but the guy that was going with us was sick, and, my, and it was raining, so my dad said, uh, let's just hunt around Greenville today. So we went up on Scammon Ridge. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. We'd never hunted Scammon Ridge in our life, but I don't know if there's still deer there today, but we went up on Scammon Ridge. We drove down a dirt road and looked at a hardwood ridge and said, oh, that looks like a good place to hunt. We got out, probably hadn't been in the woods an hour, and I jumped this deer, and uh, it ran down in front of my dad, and my dad killed it, and it ended up being the 10th biggest buck taken that year, it weighed 250 pounds. It's just an average good eight point rack it's not anything super impressive rack wise but it was a big deal it weighed 250. This rack over here. and this rack over here that's my dad's rack too my my dad uh, gave me some of his better racks to stick out in the camp here so people that's actually shot that's a farmington deer i grew up that's where i started hunting was farmington and uh so my dad i think that buck was 190 pounds shot it in farm country he was out in behind, uh, my sister married one of the Baileys and they own a bunch of land up there. My dad got it somewhere out in behind the Bailey farms, but I'm not sure just where. Awesome. We'll go in the house and have some more deer stories in the house. My, my, uh, my collection spread out through all my camps in the house. My house isn't that big, so the living room's pretty crowded, but we've got some in this camp and we got some in the being pawn camp, so my stuff's all over the place. Well, like I said, out in the camp, we've got my mounts are spread out all over the place, but uh, I've got some pretty good stories here. Every one of these bucks has got a story. This, uh, this buck here, I actually, I shot, he didn't quite make 200. I shot him late in the season. He weighed 190 something, but he had a really nice rack, nice eight point rack. But I, uh, as soon as I shot him, I end up, I saw a bigger buck and he was fighting with a bigger buck. And I don't know if you can see, but this ear here is all tore up and it's caved in and over on the side here, you can't see it, but there was a big gash in his neck. And the taxidermist asked me if I wanted him to fix all that stuff. I said, no, I want him to look just like he did. But uh, like I said, that was a nice buck. But um, as soon as I shot him, I saw a buck that was even better that it just uh, got done giving him a hard time. So that was kind of a cool story. I haven't, <clears throat> of all my years of hunting in Maine, I very rarely do you see two big bucks together. But that was one of the times. This uh, buck here that was shot up in my hometown of New Vineyard, uh, that buck weighed 214. Um, and I had actually tracked him with marginal snow. There was a little bit of snow, but then bare ground and a little bit of snow and bare ground. So I got him down into a cut and then decided that, because uh, it was getting pretty tough to track. So I made a big loop around him and he must have been searching for does because I got around him and <clears throat> I caught him with his nose right on the ground going back and forth like a hound dog and shot him. And he would have been a 12 pointer. He's got six points on this side and he's got four on here and you can't really see it, but he would have had a drop tine right there. But this side of his antler is hollow. I don't know what caused it, but it's hollow on this side and it probably was on the other side. And with that drop tine, uh, he snapped it off, so but it's still a nice, nice buck. Uh, 
the reason why the bear is such a good story is it was shot on Thanksgiving Day and uh, you'll never find a better looking bear mount because he's instead of like in September when the hair is really short I've never seen a bear mount that had that much hair on it. It's just he's beautifully furred. It's got the nice white V patch. It was a 350 pound bear and it had a unusually big head even for a 350 pound bear but the reason why he looks so good is he was shot on Thanksgiving Day instead of September. This bucking back here is uh, that was my first Cornville buck. Uh, we moved to Cornville 25 years ago and I had uh, agreed to meet my dad. My dad was still living in Farmington but he came over and that was shot on Thanksgiving Day and so that was my first Cornville buck and it was a nice one. Again it wasn't 200 but it was crowding it. It was a nice buck. This buck here is my heaviest buck that I ever shot. I shot that up in Cocajo. Uh, I was with my dad when I shot that. I actually, I've been very fortunate. I've been with my father and my son when I shot a lot of my bucks, but that buck weighed 245. Uh, I think when we were talking, the one that my dad shot that weighed 250 was the 10th biggest deer taken that year. I don't know where this ranked, but it was 245. It was a good one. This is my very first, that's probably my favorite one. Uh, I shot that when I was 13 years old. That's a Cocajo buck as well. Uh, it's the first time I ever went to Cocajo, and that was shot either on Thanksgiving Day or the day after. That was a 200-pound buck, and it had, I think it still has the most mass of any of my racks that I've shot. It was really heavy. Uh, scores in the 130s because it had such mass and long beams, but it really is almost a six-pointer. It barely has brow tied, so he's an eight-pointer, but barely. This one here is one of my better scoring racks. That's 140 inch. That's an 11 pointer. That deer weighed 239. And these two deer here were probably the same gene pool. I shot them two years apart. That one weighed 239, and that one weighed 238. And this one had a better rack, but this one, uh, you know, it was a nice buck. Stephen, my son, was with me when I shot that. This buck here, the reason why that one's special for no other reason, I, I shot it on the very last day. I thought I was going to go without getting a deer that year, and I shot that buck on the last day. It's an eight-pointer. It wasn't that heavy. I think it was 160 pounds. It's just an average buck, but uh, yeah, it was a last-day buck, which was cool. And this one is uh, one of my favorites because I killed... I was telling Brian earlier, uh, I killed a buck, I don't have it hanging in here, but I killed a 237 pound buck one year. I tracked it on dry ground, there was no snow, but it was perfect conditions. It had rained really hard the day before, and the buck crossed the road in front of us, and I had me and my dad and a couple of my cousins and a buddy, and the buck was so heavy that it was making punches in the leaves, and I was able to track him quite a ways, maybe a half a mile, close to it, just in the leaves. He went right down through the open hardwoods, and when he got out into a cut, he stopped and was looking back towards me, and I shot him. This one here, it it wasn't completely bare ground, but there was very little snow, and I actually shot this, like, right out behind our house. I went out there, and there was just a little bit of snow, and I tracked him, and when he was up on the hill, there was, you know, everything was white, but if he got in the furs... I'd lose him and I'd have to circle. But then when he went down over the hill, he went down on the link a lot. And he got down near some beaver bogs. And I could follow him in the leaves for a little bit. And when he crossed the beaver bog, I thought, well, I said, I don't know if I can, I'm going to be able to follow him. I'm going to circle around the beaver bog. And I've done that a few times. If a, if a deer, if the snow is marginal, sometimes I'll try to make loops around and then come back and find the track. But... Anyway, I, I went around the beaver bog and looked down in the open hardwoods and that buck was laying down and I snuck up on him and shot him right in his bed. He never got out of his bed. So that was kind of a, that one was over 200, but I was lucky I shot him. I think it was the first or second day of the season. It was a young deer, his rack's not very heavy, but I think he weighed 201, uh, like the first or second day of the season. So good thing I shot him early.